please. Hi, Tales from the Shed, amazingly, with the fantastic Sarah Jepson once more. Hello. I know. We have been speaking to Sarah about her personal experience mm. of abuse, but replicated so many, sadly, sadly replicated so many times uh, across with, with so many women suffering from this. So uh, we thought we'd talk to her about, she's obviously away from this relationship now, doing fantastically well. <laughs> <laughs> and we sort of talk about this beacon of hope there's hope on yeah. the other side because it sometimes people say as bad as it is I know what it is I can mm. get it I know how to survive in this relationship it's bad but I can survive I can make it that feels unknown over there mm. it feels quite scary Tell yeah us your journey your, Tell us, yeah. your you know sort of coming to the end your decision leaving yeah. how you made how it amazing it's been since and how amazing yeah, it's been. it has yeah um for me it was i think i already had two kids so i had an almost 5 year old and an almost 2 year old and it was as bad as it could get and i think there's something quite awakening about when you have children in the mix and for me it was i guess i'd hoped that the relationship would improve you know with children that naivety you know all of that kind of stuff and i think i just i didn't want to bring my children up in that environment and i could see what it was doing to me um when you add into the mix no sleep the pressures of becoming a mother and all that entails I think I just knew that if I didn't leave I probably wouldn't be here you know I I felt that bad in myself um that I knew really the only way to survive was to leave and in all honesty I I think I told one friend my parents didn't even know what was happening until like a few days before um I think in a way it was almost I had to cope with it and deal with it on my own without talking about it to other people it, it, it I think it, it felt enormous enough without then having to tell people the story how long it's been oh I thought things were better between you you got married and oh no I've been hiding and oh you know I I just I had to shut down and just focus and be like you know that laser focus on getting out so I actually rewind deliberately set up my agency although I hadn't admitted it to my time I started a marketing agency and that really was to get financial independence so I could leave because the reality was had I not done that and if I was still earning the money that I was earning employed or mater or doing three days a week there's no way I could have left him so I knew that was the biggest hurdle I had to overcome was financial independence. So I worked my absolute ass off um, two years building my agency. So I knew when I left, there'd be no going back for me. Um, I, I knew I wasn't going to be, oh, I'm coming back again with the kids. It was like, no, I am leaving and I am staying gone. But I knew for me to do that and do it with some kind of peace of mind, I, I had to have enough money to pay my rent and take care of the kids and and all of that jazz. So that's what I worked super hard on doing. Yeah. And I got myself a property that I had lined up. Unfortunately, he found out uh, about a week or two beforehand. Um, I won't go into the details of how he found out, but you know, that was my... If I'm going, I knew that I was putting myself at phenomenal risk. So I wanted to have a house and a place to go to, which is why I, I lined up the rented accommodation. Um, but unfortunately, he found out before. So for me, it was just a case of pure survival and, and protection for the children. I didn't want them growing up in a household where that was the norm for them, seeing yeah. mum flinching and... Yeah. And it's, and it's interesting because my mum on reflection then, you know, once she kind of found out what was happening, she said, oh, do you know what? I remember being on, remember Skype before Zoom. Yes, yeah. <laughs> She's like, I remember being on Skype and he came, he he came close to you and I remember you flinching. And I, and I didn't say anything at the time because I don't think I'd really comprehended what was happening, but I remember you flinching when he came near you. Um, so yeah, for me, it was just, I just, I, I needed to get out. I always say to people, there's a D-Day and then there's a leaving day. 
and yeah. the two are they can be usually a time apart because you don't go back on the d day you make that decision day and then it's like now i need to build in a plan and yeah. that might be six months it might be two years in your case yeah. it's kind of like you can't you know in an ideal world you would just go on d-day but you can't you need a you need your everything in place yeah, prep yeah. To, to I, yeah and and i think the d-day you know came like you say that that two-year builder where i i lost sense of who i was completely and it was like I cannot you know if we're on this planet one time only or whatever you believe in I don't want to spend it like this feeling empty and a shell of myself and I just didn't want that for my girls I didn't want them to witness their mum being like that um and also setting them up for the expectation that that's how men treat them. Uh, precisely that that's the norm and that's completely yeah and, and and especially you know the extraction for me was not just getting them away from from that home life his family normalized all of this too so it was wider it was deeper I needed to get them away from all of that or, or at least lessen the amount that they would be around those types of people that normalized abuse so yeah and how did you get your support because you managed to leave physically mm -hmm. how, where did you go for your support did you go to friends did you look for professional or did you find any particular agencies very useful for you um kind of a combination I think for quite a while I was in shock um I remember like my parents going Sarah every time we speak to you you're so upbeat and, and I was like I'm in survival mode I cannot think about the enormity of what has fucking happened to me I cannot think about and comprehend the life that I have led I'm in survival mode I've got to keep my business running I've got to get the girls okay and I think it probably took six straight nine months for me to then kind of have that moment where you're sat on the kitchen floor and you're sobbing and you just go into shock and I guess the trauma starts to release um I, I invested in counselling. I wanted to have um, all different types of therapies and kind of explore those. I shared details with friends, um, but it's it, it's interesting. I think there was some a lot of shame for me around even talking to my friends about it because I felt embarrassed. Um, there's also that kind of like they knew it would come to this at some point. And there's that kind of not that they would ever do that. I told you so because I do not have friends like that. But I <laughs> They're not felt, no, I felt ashamed that I'd kind of like I say allowed allowed this to happen. Um, and, you know, and you're digging deep into where was my value system with myself and where's my value system in, in the world if I was if I was able to um I can't give me some other loud but put myself or be in this situation how do I rebuild from there so that I you know hopefully wouldn't repeat it um so yeah it, it was a combination and I, I went to organizations like safe um and they're called Fear Free now. I've worked with them and they're actually, a, um, I'm working really closely with them moving forward. They help a lot of people with their domestic abuse situation. So there are entities out there, but it's, you know, it's like anything with anything that's publicly funded, there's a waiting list and, you know, so it's complicated. Um, but there's definitely organizations out there that you can research. Um, and I'm hoping to do a lot of work on that moving forward to make this kind of information way more accessible, one-stop shop where you can go to for all of these things. That would be amazing because it was just, you know, like the, the financial, the fact people have been through it. And uh, mm -hmm. you need somebody that, that's got that experience of, of what somebody needs. You need friends mm -hmm. or you need advice or just be able to talk commonly. I yeah gosh I thought I was the only one so did yeah. I you know that sort of feeling which is really nice but it's but it's also um you know there's so much energy that goes into leaving um and you're leaving generally when you are at your lowest or probably it's this kind of dichotomy of you're at your lowest but you're at your strongest because you are saying no more I'm leaving but then you have the exhaustion of what it emotionally, psychologically and everything that took you to leave. But then again, I don't want to make this sound um, negative. The, the battle continues because you have to keep plugging away at growing and rebuilding your strength. Um, so, yeah, it's 
it's a difficult time, but it creates lots of opportunities as well. Yeah. And you were fortunate, as you said, you had kind of had the foresight to say, I need this. I'm going to start this agency. And so you had that. You yeah. Know, what other kind of things kept you going? What other kind of things made you realise that you, you could keep going and you could just keep away? You know, you could be that person. I think I have always been, although, you know, this is something that's probably spoken about more now, someone that would manifest and visualise. Mm. Um, and I did that even as like a 12 or 13 year old, but I didn't know what it was called. You know, I didn't know what this thing was. I just did it. I just used to do it. You know, I would, for example, I visualized myself as a female founder as a 12 year old, but didn't know what that was because I hadn't been exposed to a businesswoman or or that kind of thing. But I remember connecting to the feeling, what I would wear, who I would be around, all of that stuff. And so when I was leaving my marriage, and even through all of the hardships and all of the hard times in between, because it's taken 10 years to rebuild, I've always, always stayed connected to a vision of calmness, contentment, um, being in a space where I can realize my potential, where my children can realize their potential. And I've just stayed really connected to that. And even when in the 10 years where I've had relationships that haven't worked out, even when I, and I won't say who it is, but this person said, you, you're you just never going to find that happiness, Sarah. Maybe it's just not for you. I'm like, no, screw that. Like, I know <laughs> it's out there. I know it's out there. And you know what? Yeah. yeah. I, I know it's out there. I truly believe that there is that person and I'm going to wait. And I'm going to, and, and also it, it gave me time to rebuild that I'm going to wait because, because I'm worthy of waiting for the right person. You know, I'm worthy of that, but also I've got a lot to give. So that person's bloody lucky to have me. And I think it took 10 years for me to really, truly believe that. Um, but yeah, I think visualizing, manifesting, staying connected to the person I wanted to allow myself to become that I knew was there. She needed waking up. But also it's like, actually, this is an opportunity for me to define like, well, who am I? Who do I want to be? What do I want to dial up in my life or dial down? Um, so, yeah, it's been a really exciting, interesting, exhausting. <laughs> and you're still on the journey. You're still on the journey. You're still manifesting. So yeah. it'd be really lovely to perhaps um, catch up again sometime, you know, when we've got a bit more time and catch up again, because I think it's been really interesting. You're going to be inspiring. I've got people I'm going to send this video to and put the connection. I, I just want but, women, I just want women or whoever is listening to know that in my mind, how I get around anything that's tough or anything that's happening in my life is everything is temporary. How I wake and feel in the morning is temporary. How I feel in the afternoon is temporary. The situation, nothing stays the same you know change is inevitable growth is optional so I'm a massive advocate of taking your life in you know taking control of your life and I don't want this to sound scary or oh yes look at her she's so driven anyone can create change and movement and forward progression in their lives whether it's looking at your circle of friends are they the people that are sharing your values, helping you propel yourself? Yes, no. Well, if they're not, where can you go hang out with more women or people that are going to allow you to do that? For me, part of my healing journey has also been not only talking therapy, but giving up alcohol, ridding myself of toxins, hiring a nutritionist. And I know that people go, well, that's okay. She's got the money to do that. There are podcasts I have learned so much from that are free. Yeah. stop making excuses like energize yourself to there is always something. That change. there's always something and accountability partners you know we've all got that one friend that can you can help motivate each other um to do and try new things and yeah I just think there's so much opportunity out there to keep growing and pushing forward and you know I feel like I am at the start of what I am capable of and if I can do it anybody can do it so and I feel your positivity yeah. I can feel it from here and I would like to pass that on so yeah. it comes yeah. across brilliant so yeah, yeah. great and I love to say change is inevitable growth is optional and I think that is um a great thing to take forward and so thanks for thanks for talking to us again today Sarah it's been brilliant. thank you so much for having me thank you we'll speak soon take care bye